1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9. Scriptures we all know, but I've got to do it again. But as it is written, we all know the scripture, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Okay, just imagine Second Peter chapter 1 that says, uh, God has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. He says, and he's given us all these great and precious promises whereby we can become partakers of the divine nature. So God has already given you all things that pertain unto life and godliness. God has given you all these great and precious promises. So if I really take these great and precious promises, it'll make me become a partaker of the divine nature. Colossians 2 verse 9 says, the fullness of the God dwells bodily in Christ. But verse 10 says, but we are complete in him. Okay, so uh, we can have everything that God, this is the same in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16 through 21, where he prays and says, I pray that you will be strengthened with might in the inner man, so that you can know the breadth, length, height, and depth, and you can be filled, so that you can be filled with all the fullness of God. I mean, that's rough scriptures, but that's God's idea about you to be filled with all God's fullness, okay? So, uh, uh, God, there's stuff that your eye have not seen. He's not talking about heaven. There's stuff that your ear has never heard, that has not come up in your heart, that God has already prepared for those that love him. Now listen to this. It says, for what man knows the things of a man, save the spirit of the man, which is in the man. Even so, the things of God knows no man but the Spirit of God. Everybody say, God's things are spiritual. And only the Spirit of God knows the things of God. No man can know God's things. Verse 12. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God. That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words that man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receive not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Everybody say, spiritual things can only be compared to spiritual. The natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit. They are spiritually discerned. I hope you hear the word spirit, spiritual, spiritually. Spirit, spiritual, spiritually, over and over and over and over again. But he that is spiritual judges all things, verse 15. Yet he himself is judge of no man. For have known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. Paul is not writing to some hippie-jibbie, creepy, heathen, Gentile group of unbelievers. Paul is writing to a very advanced group of people in Corinth. People that stand behind in no gifting. He's writing to a group of people that speak in tongues, that raise the dead, that heal the sick. He's speaking to a group of people that knows how to operate in the power of Almighty God. Yet to this group of people, he says, I can't talk to you as spiritual people because you are carnal people. He's talking to one of the most advanced churches in this, the known world then, to the church in Corinth that stood behind in nothing. Yet he tells them they are carnal. But spiritual gifts, they were advanced in spiritual gifts. So he's talking about something deeper then speaking in tongues, raising the dead, healing the sick. He's talking about something, he says, if you want to be spiritual, you can only compare it to spiritual things. And if you want the true things of God, you can only be received and discerned spiritual. 
For 1 Corinthians 12 says, When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I thought as a child. You know, he says, So uh, if I have all the tongues of men and angels, if I give my body over to be burned, if I have, you know, all this stuff, I'm still a child. He says, But when I've become a mature man, I will lay down the things of a child. In other words, I will come to a place where I don't operate in the gifts of the Spirit of God. I will come to a place where I'm spiritual and I move under the Spirit of Almighty God. Not a gift of the Spirit, but the leading of the Spirit, the fullness of the Spirit, the power of the Spirit. In other words, I will not operate with gifts. I will operate like Jesus Christ. The Spirit of the Lord God is now upon me. I will operate under Isaiah 11. It says, on him shall the spirit of the Lord rest. The spirit of wisdom, not a word of wisdom. The spirit of knowledge, not a word of knowledge. Okay? The giftings is just a little word. But the fullness is, my goodness, what the eye hath not seen and the ear hath not heard. We have not received the spirit of this world, but the spirit which is of God. So that we can know the things. Okay? So... Paul writes to these guys, he says, I couldn't speak to you as unto spiritual, but I only have to speak unto you as unto carnal. So something was lacking in this church. What was lacking? Spirituality. They lacked a spiritual awakening. They lacked a visitation. They lacked a revival. What they needed was a revival. And I would say most churches need a revival. They got so used to come together on Sunday. They know how to operate. They know how to do the jigs. They know how to do the steps. They know how to play. They know how to worship. They know how. But God is not there. They can heal sick. They can even raise the dead. But it doesn't say God is there. Just like you know how to run your business, you can learn how to run the church. And you can look successful from the outside. But Paul can write a letter to you and say, you are just babies. You are so carnal. You lack something that is called spiritual. So Paul writes to the Thessalonian church in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23, 24. He says, I pray to God that your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved till the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, if you preserve something, you keep it from decaying. In other words, your spirit can lack. Because he prays that your spirit may be preserved until the coming. So your spirit don't have to always be on top, but it can always be on top. If Paul prays that your whole spirit be uh, uh, preserved and your soul be preserved and your body be preserved in other words there's going to be a group of people when Jesus comes first John chapter 3 verse 1 beloved we do not know what we shall be hereafter but this we do know that when he comes we shall already be like him so there's going to be a group of people that will be spiritually mature soulish mature bodily mature in other words their spirits will be high their souls will have peace and their body will be totally well there will be a group of perfect people before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ecclesiastes 11 verse 5 says more or less the following. As you know not the way of the wind, and you know not the way of the Spirit of God in the bones and the womb of a woman, so you know not the things of God. But here Paul comes and he says, you have received the Spirit so that you can know. Okay, so there's a group of people that do not know the things of God. But there's a group of people that can know the things of God. So we've got to decide which group we're going to be in. Let's go to Isaiah 57, verse 15. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and a humble spirit. To revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite one. Verse 19. I create the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace to him that is afar off and to him that is near. But this is Old Testament. I just want to help you. That scripture is quoted in Ephesians 2 verse 17. 
When Paul writes to the Ephesian church, that scripture is quoted to the Ephesian church. He said, uh, God says, peace, peace to those that are far and those that are near, talking about the crucified Christ. Yes. Chapter 58, verse 8. Then shall your light break forth as the morning. Your health shall spring forth speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear reward. Yes. Then shall you call and the Lord shall answer. You shall cry and he shall say, here am I. Verse 15 of chapter 57. God says, I am from eternity. I stay in a high place, but also with him that is of a humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble. James chapter 4. Old new. Old new to see what is scripture and what is not. Verse 5. Do you suppose... That the scripture is speaking to no purpose that says, The spirit whom God has caused to dwell in us, yearns over us and yearns for the spirit to be welcome with a jealous love. God stays in a high and a lofty place. Yet he stays with the humble. So there's the habitation. There's the staying, the dwelling place. God dwells with those that are of a humble spirit. Yeah. To revive the spirit of the humble. In other words, God's already staying with you. You are already the home of God. You are already the abiding place of God. You are already the temple of God. Yet he says if your spirit is humble, he's going to revive your spirit. Okay? So he says the spirit of God that's in us. That is not Holy Spirit. That is the spirit of creation that God breathed on you when you became man. The spirit that came in your mother's womb when your bones were starting to form. That is the spirit of man that's in him. God breathed on Adam. The breath of life, which is in Hebrew the same word for wind and the same word for spirit. In our African languages, the same. The same word for wind, breath, and spirit. There's no difference. Okay, so God breathed. And man became a living soul. So when your father and your mother came together, conception took place, the spirit came in the womb of your mother. That spirit that makes you a person. That spirit yearns to welcome the Holy Spirit with a jealous love. Okay? So the spirit of man will never be satisfied Till he's given over to the jealous love of a jealous God. God says, you shall serve the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. You must remember the Lord your God is a jealous God. God wants all of you. God wants to control you. God wants to inhabit you. God wants to lead you. God wants to guide you. God wants to bless you. But he says, your spirit is yearning for the Holy Spirit yes, yes. with a jealous love. Yes. So whenever you are not happy with what you are doing, whenever you are not truly satisfied in your life, what is happening, the Spirit on the inside of you says, I need more of the Holy Spirit. My spirit is not complete. I need a spiritual awakening. I need a spiritual revival. I need a spiritual visitation. Yes. Listen to verse 6. But he gives us more and more grace. Power of the Holy Spirit to meet this evil tendency. What evil tendency? That we don't yearn for the Spirit of God to revive our human spirit. That is why he says, God sets himself against the proud and the haughty, but gives grace to the humble. Okay. Verse 10, so humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Who's James writing to? Brothers. Dear brothers, he's writing to the saints. He's writing to very advanced people. And he says to this very advanced beloved brothers in Christ, he says, you know what? You have a spirit on the inside of you that yearns with a jealous love for the Spirit of God to be on the Spirit. Yeah. And here it comes. He says, God's going to give you more and more grace. 
This is how it will happen. If you humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, He's going to lift you up. <laughs> okay? So let's go back to the Old Testament, Genesis 45. He says in verse 13, he says, uh, And you shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt, and of all that you have seen, and shall taste and bring your father. Verse 25, And they went up out of Egypt and came into the land of Canaan unto Jacob their father, and told him, saying, Joseph is alive. He is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed them not. And they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob their father revived. We are still in the Old Testament. We are not even where the spirit is poured out and there was already spiritual revivals. Many of the scriptures we call spirit in the New Testament and we put in Holy Spirit is not Holy Spirit. It's your spirit. You know, so we struggle with many of the stuff because we put it on God's side. And on the other side, God has put it on your side. And we read spirit, spirit, and we always read Holy Spirit. Because, ah, you've got a spirit. It's coming from me. The spirit comes from God. And that spirit needs revival from time to time. It needs refreshing from time to time. It needs a visitation from time to time. It's yearning with a jealous love for the Spirit of God to fully be in control. God stays with the humble to revive the spirit of the humble. So here comes Jacob and his spirit was revived. Not his soul. Not his body. His spirit. Now this is an old man. He's struggling with life. When his spirit was revived, his whole being came together. His soul jumped up within him. His body received strength. And all of a sudden, he was like a young man living again. Sorry. The word is revived. When his spirit was revived, Jacob all of a sudden had a new life. Enjoy life, man, man, man. This man by the name of Samson. Man, this man is so strong that without the Holy Spirit, he pulls out the gates of the city. This was a strong man. But then, you know, he took those thousand Philistines. To pick up the donkey's jawbone, you know, bam, 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 thousand guys. Okay, come, line up. Thousand people. I mean, Judges 15. Verse 18. And when he threw the donkey's jawbone away, he was sore th thirst. And called on the Lord and said, Yeah, you have given me this great deliverance into the hand of your servant. And now, shall I die for thirst? Yeah. Listen to the words. Shall I die for thirst? And fall into the hand of the uncircumcised? But God clave a hollow place that was in the jaw, and there came water out there, there out. Came water there out. And when he had drunk, his spirit came again, and he revived. This man wasn't dead. He said, Lord, shall I die because I'm so thirsty? My spirit is with a jealous love, thirsting for the spirit of God to touch my spirit so that I can be revived, refreshed, renewed, so that my soul can come in line, so that my body can jump up, so that I can be a superman of God, that I can live in a revival state because I've humbled my spirit enough so Samson just killed a thousand Philistines. Amen. So he humbles himself. Oh God, your servant has just killed a thousand people. Now I'm thirsty for you. I just saw with my own hand how I killed a thousand Philistines. Now I'm so thirsty for you. Must I die with this thirst? And here comes the Spirit revived his spirit bam and Samson had his own personal revival Job chapter 10 you have granted me life 
and favor. And your visitation hath preserved my spirit. As you know not the way of the wind, know not the way of the spirit in a womb, so you know not the ways of God. The eye hath not seen, ear not heard, heart not come with the thing that God has prayed. But God reveals them to us by His Spirit. You don't know the things if you're natural and carnal, but God reveals them to us by His Spirit because spiritual things need to be discerned with spiritual things and compared to spiritual things. But we have received the Spirit of God so that we can know the things of God. So I can know there is a wind. And I can invite that wind, Song of Solomon, come wind, north wind, come and blow. Come, oh, south wind, come and blow. That the fragrances of God can just spread throughout of his garden. If I don't know God can visit me, I will have all these funny cliches and I have all these new doctrines. You know, that doesn't bring life to the church. It's cold and dead and dry. But we want the church that's alive and well. So we know if God puts spirit in a womb, God has a wind. If God has a wind, God has a spirit. And I can invite the wind and say, I need a visit. Father, our church need a visitation. We don't want a dry, dead, formal theology. We want the wind of God. Come, wind of God. If I know there is a wind of God, the spirit of God can lift me up. Pew in the midst of a dry crowd and put me down in a valley full of dry bones and say son of man can these bones live i said oh god you know he says now prophesy over the wind and say a wind of god blow into these bones and the bones came together and you can check it out and they revived Okay, so if I know there's a wind, I can invite the wind. I can prophesy over the wind. And I can have a visitation of the Spirit in my church. And the spirits of men will be revived and renewed. And people will talk about it. Acts chapter 3. You know, God's going to send Jesus, verse 20. Oh no, verse 19. Repent therefore, be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when, when, not if, when, when times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, now here comes the, the scripture for the rapture drillers, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Jump over to the Amplified. He says, uh, so that you may get a reviving, verse 19. You see that there? reviving with fresh air in other words the wind of god and he may send to you jesus christ who was designated appointed whom heaven must receive and retain until the time for the complete restoration of the things that god has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets for ages past from the most ancient time of memory of man dear father Job 33, 4 says, The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. So, listen to this. Peter preaches to the house of Israel. He said, you've got to repent so that when times of refreshing comes, when it comes, not if it comes, when it, so it's going to come. Times of refreshing is going to come. And when you feel it come, you got to know this is now a time to press into something bigger than you had in the previous refreshing. Okay? So, till the time that all things are restored, of which all the prophets spoke about, since the beginning of the memory of man. Okay, please. So, so he's referring to Genesis. When God made man in his own image and his own likeness, and God breathed on man. Now, Acts chapter 3 says, when times of refreshing comes, it's time to realize 
push harder because the total restoration of all things since the memory of man was there. And when all things have been restored, Jesus will come again. But he will not come before that. There it is in your Bible. Heaven must retain him until the time of total restitution or restoration of all things since the beginning of time. In other words, if we're not yet walking in total authority, total victory, total kings and priests by the blood of Jesus, Jesus is not coming. He's not coming when Iran is fighting and Iraq is in a war and England is invading Europe and Europe is struggling with America and America is struggling with the president of Russia. Jesus is not coming. He's coming when the church is restored into their full creation responsibility. That's what we just read to you. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 21 says, Holy men of old wrote. So this Bible is written by holy men of old. Under the inspiration. Everybody says inspiration. Inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So these guys were inspired by the Holy Spirit and they wrote this book that we call Bible today. All right? Job 32. Verse 8 of chapter 32. But there is a spirit in man. And the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. Okay. What I'm trying to say is this. Holy men of old wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So Job says there's a spirit in man. And the inspiration of God will give that spirit understanding okay now listen to the Ephesian letter I pray to God that he will give you a spirit of revelation eyes of your understanding being enlightened so that you may know okay I did such a long turn to quote the scripture okay we don't know the things, but you can know the things. No man know the things, but the spiritual people can know the things because they come from the Spirit of God. So here we come to this whole long cycle, and he says, they wrote by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. There's a spirit in man, and the inspiration of God will give that spirit understanding. So Paul writes to the, not now to Corinthians, now to Ephesians, the model church of the New Testament. The model church, the guys that know they are elected, they chosen in the beloved, they know this is the model church. In chapter 1, to the model church, I pray that you will get a spirit of wisdom, understanding, so that you may know. So what is Paul writing to the Ephesian church? You need revival. Okay. The angel of the Lord and Jesus appears to John on the Isle of Patmos. The first letter is to the Ephesian church. He says, if you don't repent, I'm going to remove your candle stick. In other words, you will not be part of this model church that brings the life to the nations. Okay, so in chapter 1, Paul says, Ephesian church, you need the spirit of inspiration to touch your spirit so that you can have understanding that you can know. Let's go to Isaiah 26. With my soul, Isaiah 26 verse 9. With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Listen to this. My spirit within me will seek you early. In other words, when God wake me up at night, all of a sudden my soul doesn't speak. All of a sudden my spirit rises up and says, I'm thirsty for God. Hebrews 4. Amplified Bible, verse 12. The Word of God is so full of power. It make, it's, it's making it active, operative, energizing, and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating to the dividing line of the breath of life, the soul. And the immortal spirit that joins the marrow of the deepest parts of our nature Exposing, sifting, analyzing, excuse me, and judging the very thoughts and the purposes of the heart. Mm. Okay. 
Okay, so the, the, the word of God. If I apply the word of God, energizing, operative, you know, active in my life. In other words, it's not a letter that I read. It's active. It's operative. It's full of energy. So Jesus comes and he says in John 6, 63, the letter kills. So if I just read letter, it can kill me. But the spirit gives life. So the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So I've got to get past the written letter and I've got to get to the energizing, operative, active, inspired word that made the prophets write to now speak to my life. And if that word is energized, operative, and active, it'll be a sword that'll cut through my soul and my spirit. Put my soul that side, my emotions, my will, my feelings. Put my spirit on that side and said, now let's discern what have you been doing. Are you soulish or are you spiritual? Are you carnal and natural or are you really spiritual? So the word will help me if I really get into it active, operative and energizing. I will all of a sudden know, my goodness, I need some spirit on my life. The context where Jesus says, the words that I speak to you, spirit and life, he said, my, my, my body is truly bread. My blood is truly drink. Moses did not give you bread. But my father gives you the true bread from heaven. And the people started turning away and says, no, this is a hard word. Who can eat flesh and drink blood? That sounds bad. So they turned away. So Jesus said, hey, you know what those guys heard? They heard the letter. They did not hear what I spoke to their spirits. The letter that they heard will kill them. Because Jesus said, you're going to all die in your religion. But the words that I speak are spirit and life. So if you can hear, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the spirit says. So you've got to hear by your spirit what the spirit says. Other words, you're just going to be happy for a while and then it'll die. So he says, they're going to die. But the words that I speak are spirit and life. He says, and then more people left. And then Jesus turned to the apostles and he said, do you also want to leave? And Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Verse 68. Because with you are the words of life. God, we heard Jesus. Jesus says, Peter, we are hearing. We can hear. We can hear you. Yo, you have the words of life. Just speak, Jesus. Speak. We are hearing. That's why when Jesus walked on the water and said, it's I, Peter said, I heard. If it's you, then speak. If it's you, speak. I will come. I will come. But I've got to hear with my spirit. It's you that speaks. I don't want to hear a letter. I want to hear spirit. Hmm? So I have a soul man that's very emotional. I have a spirit man that's totally neutral. It acts on how I decide it'll act. So Paul says, with my spirit I serve God. Romans 1 verse 9. Okay? Paul says, we who worship God in spirit are the true circumcised. Yeah. They are not Jews that says they are Jews, but they that are after the spirit, they are Jews. Amen. Okay? He says, but those that call themselves Jews and live in a synagogue, they are the synagogue of Satan. Jesus, not me, Jesus. Okay, so don't blame me, you know, blame Jesus. So people come to church. Now remember the Corinth church, the Ephesian church, remember the letter of James, all for super Christians. If I receive the spiritual word that's alive, energizing, and active, it'll cut. It'll say, hey, Kubis, take that soul man and put it aside. Take that spirit man and get it to be operative. So we come to church like tonight. And this is how we will act. Not you, but you know when you go to church and you preach, this is how people will act. They'll say, what a word. Sha, what a word. Wow, thank you, Kubas. That, uh, that was an awesome message, man. Kubas, bless you. This word really touched me tonight. 
if it does not work Monday, you did not hear what the Spirit said. You heard the letter that I preached. If it's working, the word cut through and put your soul aside and revived your spirit. If your spirit is not revived after the word, it shows we need a fresher visitation than ever before. Now you can decide which one rules. When the situation comes for me to react, reaction is never spiritual. It's always from the soul. But ruling is always from the spirit. So if somebody says something and I react, I need a visitation. I need a revival. I'm proving that I'm carnal. I'm proving that I'm in the flesh and my soul is dominating my spirit. Any reaction is from the soul realm. But all ruling is from the spirit realm. So I decide how much is the word operative in my life? How is it cutting my soul away from my spirit? How is it discerning my thoughts and the intents of my heart? I want to help you right. You know, you were not good when you, when you walked through the door, the way you treated that guy. What? You want to tell me? Hey. You are proven that you need a visitation. Your spirit is not humble. Your soul is dominating. Serious stuff. Serious stuff. So, uh, he that is of a humble spirit, God dwells with him. For one purpose, to revive his spirit. So the guy that already humbles himself in his spirit will have the opportunity to get a revival in his spirit. And the one that is revived in his spirit, his soul will be, bam, super peace. His body, bam, super health. His atmosphere, super joy. And he will have control of his emotions. If you heard the Spirit, the word that was good on Sunday will be operative on Tuesday. Because if you look at the cross cut of the church, are they spiritual or are they carnal? Carnal is your, fle your flesh is in control by your spirit. Did you know your body, your soul needs your body to express itself? Your soul can only express itself through your body. But your spirit needs nothing to prove anything. The spirit operates totally independent of your soul or your body. I'll prove it to you. Colossians 2 verse 5 through 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians, you know, what is the other chapters? Listen to this. Paul says, Although I'm absent in the flesh... I'm present in the spirit. Amen. And I could see how you behaved. And when you are gathered with my spirit, I want you to help that man out of the church that acts like a hooligan. Because my spirit is present with you. But I know in body I'm not here. Okay, let me help you. How could Paul write the exact problem of every church from prison from another city. Amen. So he would sit in Philippi and he would write to Ephesians. He would sit in Corinth and he would write to Rome. He would sit, you know, and he would write the exact situation and problems. He says, bodily I could not be there, but I did. I was present in the spirit. So I saw how you were behaving. And I see there's people that are behaving like dogs. Those Judaizers that want to put you in the law. Don't let them put you under subjection of the law for one minute. I'm quoting the Bible. He says, because God already spoiled principalities and powers and dominions and things present. It's already under his feet. And you are free and liberated. Don't come under subjection to those laws. He says, my spirit was there. Although I couldn't be there in body because I was in prison in another city. 
Huh? But my soul needs my body to express itself. So my body goes into convulsions. You, 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 you. He says, reaction proves carnality. Prove your soul is in total dominion. You need your spirit to be revived. You need to know where the wind comes from. You need to know how the spirit comes inside a man. You need to know and you need to invite a visitation from God. Oh, wind of God, blow over me. Oh, rain of God, fall upon me. Holy Spirit, come, come. Holy Spirit, come. Let's go to Mark 4. And he said to them, verse 13, Know you not this parable? The sower sows the word. And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. They heard. Then Satan comes immediately and takes away what was sown in their hearts. So the word fell in their hearts, man. And they, these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground. When they heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. Oh, what a word. Shukubas tonight. Oh, man, I've got to get the CD. Yeah. But they have no root in themselves and so endure for a time afterward when affliction or persecution arise. For the word's sake, immediately they are offended. In other words, when the word is tested on Monday. You don't take the word. You are offended by the word. You don't let it operate. You oppose it. And these are they which sown among thorns. They heard the word. See, they all heard. And the cares of this world, the deceitful of riches, the lust of the other things, end to choke the word, become unfruitful. And these are they which are sown on good ground. They heard the word, receive the word, and bring forth fruit. 30, 60, 100. And he said unto them, Is a candle brought to be put under a bushel? Just listen to Luke 8, 15. But those on good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. The wayside, stony ground, and thorny ground are all Christians. That hasn't got their spirits to be in control. All three of those people are the realm of the soul people. They all were in different reactions when the word was tested. But the guy that were good ground received the word, kept the word, didn't deviate from the word. John 15. I am the true vine, my father the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Every one that beareth fruit, he purchased. You are already clean through the word which I have spoken. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit in itself except it abide in me, the vine no more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, you the branches, ye that abide in me, I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man, man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is with it, and men gather them, cast them in the fire. Verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. If you receive the word, listen, and it stays in you, whatsoever you ask, you get. I'm going to put it in other words. The spiritual man can get anything from God. The soulish man will run after desires and try to satisfy his own appetite that he can't get victory over. So what God is saying is grow up. If my word abide in you, remember Mark 4 and Luke 8. He that is good ground is the one that hears the word and sticks to the word and the word stays on the inside of him. The other one, the word is stolen. So Sunday, what a word. Monday, I'm tested and I'm offended. I don't want to bow to the word I heard on Sunday. No, no, no. No, no, no. Let me tell you what I think. 
So what you're actually saying is, I'm still carnal, I'm still fleshly, I still can't get my prayers answered. I've just proven to you that the word is not operative in my life, it's not energizing in my life, it's not active in my life. I am proven to myself and to my whole household, I'm a soulish, carnal, natural Christian. I'm saved. I'm washed in the blood. I'm filled with the Spirit. I speak in tongues. I heal the sick, but I'm still not spiritual. Galatians 5.22. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, meekness, temperance, faith. I'll throw it in. Not the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit the one that received the word. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. If you abide in me, you shall bear fruit. And the fruit that you bear will show that you are my disciples. You are the fruit bearer, not the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Hmm? So now we can jump back to verse 16. Walk in the Spirit. Not the Holy Spirit. Walk after your spirit that's created from God. The Spirit of the Lord has made me and the breath of the Almighty. Walk after your dictates after your spirit. The man that's been resting for 27 years. Wake him up. Put him in charge of your life. Get your soul under control. And if I walk after my spirit, I shall not fulfill the lust of my flesh. Okay, so my soul and my flesh work together. My flesh can only manifest by the feelings of my soul. But my spirit is independent. My spirit can operate totally outside of my body. My spirit can visit Thailand and preach while I'm sleeping in my bed. Ezekiel is sitting in the midst of the captives. And he saw visions of heaven. And he said, you must read chapter 3, chapter 11, chapter 27, chapter 37. And the Spirit lifted me up. Where's Ezekiel? Sitting. Where's he going? To a valley. The people around him, they see him sitting. He's not going anywhere. But for, for Ezekiel, the Spirit lifted me up, carried me away. Put me down in a valley. Where's Ezekiel? In the midst of the captives. What does the captive see? Ezekiel. What does Ezekiel see? Visions of heaven. A temple with water flowing out. Valleys full of dry bones. The spirit standing there. The spirit lifting me up. Where's Ezekiel? In the midst of the captives. So God is spirit. Yet you are created in his image in a fleshly fashion. So God appeared unto Abraham. He saw a man called Melchizedek. But it was God manifested in flesh. Thank you. So the spirit can operate, manifest anywhere, any place, totally independent of your soul or your body. In other words, my spirit has such powers that I can totally put my soul under control. And I can say, spirit man, you're not going to let the soul react again. So I say, soul, bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. O soul, remember, God has got good benefits. Soul, he forgives your iniquities. Body, he heals all your sicknesses. O man, he crowns you with goodness and mercy. He restores your youth like that of an eagle. So spirit man is talking. So David is a man after God's own heart because he allows his spirit to rule his soul man. Okay? So what we're going to do the rest of our lives, are we going to be in reaction or are we going to start ruling? What am I trying to say? We need a revival of the spirit. We need our candles to be lit by God again. We need the wind of God to come and blow over us. And we've got the power to say, wind of God, see those dead bones, blow over them. Then I can talk to the Spirit and say, Spirit, bring life into these bodies. If I can do that, in other words, I can do it to myself. I can say, mm, so, bless the Lord. So, you're going to have peace, joy, love, because the fruit of my Spirit... 
I am in the vine, so I can have fruit. Not the Holy Spirit. It's got nothing to do with Him. It's got to do with you. The fruit of your spirit. Okay. Now, I know. Oh, Kubis, this is an awesome revelation. No, brother, this is the stuff that E.W. Kenyon wrote in 1920. But we didn't want to receive it because it was too far ahead of us. But he wrote the whole book of Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, where it says spirit is not God, it's spirit, it's your spirit. And he proved it. Romans 8. You know? The spirit and the flesh and the spirit of the flesh. Not the Holy Spirit, your spirit. And then he says, my spirit testifies with the Holy Spirit. This, the flesh cannot please God, but the spirit can. I'm adapted to my spirit to live after my spirit. Not the Holy Spirit. I'm a debtor to allow my spirit to rise up within me and become spiritual. I'm just reading. You don't have to turn. Thus saith the Lord, your God, I have heard your prayer and I have seen your tears. Now the guy speaks back. He said, I was like a twittering swallow or a crane, a bird. So do I chirp and I chatter. I moan like a dove. My eyes are weary and dim with looking upward. Oh Lord, I'm oppressed. Take my side and be my security as a debtor being sent to prison. But what can I say? For he hath both spoken to me and he himself has done this. I must go softly all my years and my sleep has fled because of the bitterness of my soul. Oh Lord, by these things do a man live. And all these is the life of my spirit. Oh, give me back my health and make me live. That's the word of Hezekiah when he got the word that he's going to die. And he said, oh God, if my spirit can get a revival, my body will automatically be healed and so will my soul spring up within me. And God said to the prophet, Turn back and tell the man I add 15 more years to his life. Because he didn't pray for a soulish revival. He didn't pray for a fleshly healing. He prayed, oh God, my spirit can live. If I understand by looking upward and I cry to you, my spirit man are thirsty for you. God says, I've heard your cries. I've seen your tears. Go tell the man I add 15 more years to his life. And he said, my soul and my body immediately became healthy because I cried for a spiritual revival more than anything else in this world hmm? so if you abide in me and my words in you you shall ask whatsoever you will it shall be given you imagine if we look for a spiritual renewal spiritual revival spiritual visitation we can go home and ask whatever we will so if my spirit is high, God says, you'll know how to control one million rand. Yeah. But if your soul is high, you will mess up with one million rand. Yeah. <laughs> if your spirit is high, I can give you a new Mercedes Benz. Yeah. But if it's low, stick to the Uno. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. How far can God entrust you with stuff? Hmm? How many leaders in church world, how many people that had supernatural charisma and anointing that could have shaken our nations, stood up and we all looked up to see them down the ditch the next week or the next year. Because when success came, they couldn't handle it. Why? Because they didn't pay attention to their spirit man. They paid attention to, you know, having a revival, but a soulish revival. And I want to say it, 90% of the revivals we had were soulish revivals. Because it didn't change our communities into a spiritual renewal. Yeah. But what if we say, Lord, if it must be restored, Acts 3, to the beginning of man. You got that scripture. Then it means I must be controlled by my spirit. I must have the breath of God on the inside of me. Like Job said, and God restored him. 
There is a spirit in man, and the breath of the Almighty gives it life. The Lord will light my candle. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. If my word abide in you, it will cut through. Put your soul aside. Lift your spirit up. Dominate your soul, and you will be able to ask whatsoever you will, because you will be in the vine, and the sap you will draw will be from me, and the Holy Spirit will guide you in ways never known here to and before. Because God says you have only started, but now you're stepping into more, 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 much, much more. By the Spirit you will live, and supernaturally I will give. And you will understand all over the land that I'm taking you by the hand, bringing you right into my presence like never before. Have you seen the doors opening to my heavenly store? So I'm ready to bless you like you've never seen here to and before. Don't stop here. Now you're only entering into more. But my Spirit will lead you. My Spirit will guide you. And you will understand this is a day of the spiritual power. Don't wait for another hour. Be revived here right now And don't ask how Just call for your spirit to stand up on the inside of you And you'll be able the greater works to do In this very minute God says Be revived, be renewed, be restored Don't wait for another day to come Because I'm ready to pour out all of my glory Not on just some But all of you will get So let my spirit move in you And let my spirit guide you But you can walk in the spirit And you can understand But you will hear my voice but tonight you got to make the quality choice speak to your spirit man and let it arise and you will understand you are now standing in the fullness the full measure of the Christ's size Amen